Shalom, shalom, and welcome to our special presentation of Black History. That's Black History, the Children of Judah. And Shalom, brothers and sisters, it's your brother Benaya Ben Israel. And today we're going to review Black History, as you probably have never heard before. It's going to be comprehensive. And this presentation of Black History will fill in a lot of gaps that have existed over the years when it comes to the retelling of Black History, especially here in the States. So first, let's get started because we have quite a bit of territory to cover. So let's get started. Let's start off by first reviewing the common ways that we research history today. So when we research black history today, many folks use tools such as Ancestry.com or FamilyTreeNow.com. Now, these tools are good because they have access to official government records such as the U.S. Census, marriage certificates, death certificates, birth certificates, enlistment records, and slave manifests, just to name a few. And using these records, we are often able to at least go back and research our history back through the, the 1900s and the, the 1800s. For example, when I was asked by my father to research the history of my family, I was actually surprised to learn that my family had fought in World War One, World War II, uh, the Korean War, and also the Vietnam War. Of course, I knew about that because my father was a, an army ranger in, in Vietnam. And that was, you know, something to be uh, proud of. However, I was also able to go back a little bit further uh, in the 1800s during the time of slavery. And I learned that my family also served as slaves in Opelika, Alabama, which, you know, believe it or not, I believe it's uh, less than 200 miles from, from where I, I live today. And it was sobering for me to, to know that I live, you know, not too far from where my family probably toiled in the hot sun and uh, didn't have a good time in Alabama. It was a sobering thought for me. But, you know, kind of stepping back, I was at least able to track my history back to the 1800s. And this is where the line of history for most African-Americans, so-called African-Americans, go cold. Now, we are able to, to supplement some of that. We are able to use tools such as, you know, DNA tools. And DNA tools, are some of them are good as, as far as telling you that, you know, 10% of you are, is related to Nigeria. 30% of you, are, you're related to uh, the Congolese. But it, it's not exactly what we're looking for, right? And then we also have the history that's that's taught in the public school systems today, uh, which focus on the transatlantic slave trade, which it should. However, the transatlantic slave trade, th that history usually only goes back to the 1600s. And so we're left with a history that only goes back to the 1600s, whereas other races or groups of people are able to go back much, much further than that. So from a black history perspective, we are wanting more. Now, just to review some additional things um, that kind of play a part in black history, you know, over the years, we were given names to identify ourselves throughout our stay here, in the, in the, especially in the, in the U.S. Uh, we were called uh, African-American, and you may, some may be surprised to know that that was a, um, I guess, a rebranding of a, of a term that had been sporadically used before the 1900s, but of course, I think we give uh, credit to, to Jesse Jackson for, um, for assigning the name African American to us here in the U.S. However, you know, before African American was used, we were also called color. And you can see that there's two different spellings of the word color. C-O-L-O-R-E-D uh, was used, first used in 18. 32, according to the Webster Dictionary, or C-O-L-O-U-R-E-D, that was used in the 1600s. That goes back pretty far. And that's according to the Oxford Dictionary. However, if you look all the way at the bottom, we have the word Negro. And wow, look at that, 1555. And um, we're actually going to come back to the word Negro. I believe that word is, will help us identify true black history for the so-called African-American. But let's just take a note that the uh, word Negro, you know, goes back pretty far in history. So when we take a step back and look at our at the history of the so-called African-American, we can see that for the most part, our history goes back to the 1600s. We can see that with the tools such as Ancestry.com and Family Tree now.com uh, those at least for for the so-called african-american 
those would take us back to the 1800s, and then we have some, you know, some scholastic uh, history books that'll take us back to the 1600s. But again, you know, this doesn't go back far enough. You know, there's missing history. In other words, you know, we run into a roadblock, a brick wall, so to speak. And this is a brick wall that we've run into over and over again. Well, the time has come to go beyond this barrier. What we found in researching our history, we found that to get past this barrier, you need three things. And these three things are critical in for us to reclaim the true history of the so-called African-American. And here they are. So whenever black history is taught, these three things are always, I repeat, they are always left out of black history. For example, and I'm sure you, you see it there on your screen, the first thing that's left out is the Inquisition. Now, you may be wondering, why would we include the Inquisition in black history? Well, you may be surprised to know that the Inquisition occurred around the same time as the transatlantic slave trade by the same countries in the same places that the transatlantic slave trade occurred in against the same people. It's almost like a crime occurring, you had a, a suspect that was present in all the places that the crimes occurred, but no one questioned that suspect. And we, we know that that doesn't make any sense. So we're going to read references uh, pointing out the placement of the Inquisition in black history. And then the, the second thing that's always left out of black history are the palpable bulls and the edicts. Now, if you don't know what a palpable bull is, a palpable bull is like a, it's a declaration that comes out of the Church of Rome. And a lot of these palpables are very significant for the so-called African-American. I mean, we really do need to take some time to go back and read these palpables to understand what significance they have to the so-called African-American. And same thing for the edicts. The edicts are declarations, and these are edicts uh, or you know, expulsion edicts that were issued by kings and queens you know, of heads of state. So for, for example, we're going to review an edict or an expulsion edict from Spain or an expulsion edict from, from Portugal. And we will see that these two play a direct role in African American history. And then last but not least, the thing that is left out of our history is has to do with the description, the true description of the Jews, of Spain and Portugal. We're going to zero in on Spain and Portugal. Now, the reason why we focus so much on Spain and Portugal is because this is where the transatlantic slave trade started, right? And this is where the Inquisition started. Again, I said it was the same country, same places. So we're going to tie these things back into to, uh, so-called African-American history. And what I'm going to show you is that when you plug these three things back into our history, you then get a continuous, a continuous line of history from present day all the way back to, well, you'll see it goes all the way back to Jerusalem if we care to, care to uh, follow that path all the way back. However, we're not going to go that far back in this presentation. Um, we are going to go back, however, I will say to mm, probably, we're going to focus on the time just before the transatlantic slave trade started. So if you're looking at the screen, I have a timeline up on the screen and you'll see that right in the middle, you know, right at 1500 is where the transatlantic slave trade starts. Right. So 1501, roughly 1501 is when the transatlantic slave trade starts. But if you're if you look at the screen there, you'll notice that there are a couple of interesting milestones that occurred just before the transatlantic slave trade started. A couple of key milestones. And also, if you look at the top, you'll see where the Inquisition was started around the year 1480. Although it was started, or at least authorized in 1480, it really didn't get started until the 1500s, right around the time of the transatlantic slave trade. So we're going to look at look in this. We're going to take a look at some of these uh, palpables. If you go all the way to the left, you'll see the palpable doom diversus. You know, it authorizes conquest and slavery. Uh, in particular for Spain and Portugal. In Romanus Pontifex, same thing. Then also the palpable that authorized the Inquisition. So a, a lot of this plays a part in so-called African-American history. 
All right, well, let's get started. And so we're going to take a look at the time just before the transatlantic slave trade started. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to take a look at the description of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews. And just before we get started, I, I do want to point out that the references that we use, we always use references that are older, that are from the 1800s or, or older. That's, you know, when you open up a book, you look at the very first page, which is which is usually the title page. It'll have the title on there. It'll have the author on there. And then at the very bottom, it'll have the publication date. Well, what's important for us is the publication date. So we try to only use books in which the publication date is from the 1800s or older. You know, from 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, you get it, right? So we tend to stay away from books that have a publication date of 1900 or newer, or like 1900 or 2012, 2002, that sort of thing, okay? And the reason why we do that is because we've, in doing this research, we've noticed that there is a definite difference in the history that's contained in the newer books versus the older books. You know, the books that are were written in the 1900s and 2000s, they say something completely different than the books that were written in the 1800s and older. So for this, you'll see, I'll try to point out some of these publication dates if, if we can get to them. And also, um, just from logistics, the references contained in, within this video, I usually post them on the website as uh, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash uh, Benea for Israel, you know, the number four, uh, Israel.org. Um, and I should have a, um, um, a link up here shortly. But it's just that if you want to take a look at these references yourself, read these books yourself, you're more than welcome uh, to do so. And actually, I encourage it because oftentimes you, you really don't believe something until you read it yourself and you put the work in yourself. So the, the whole point of, of this presentation is to empower you to go and look up your own history and to read it for yourself to see what other people said about you. Right. To see what they said about you, because I didn't write any of these books, like all these books that we're getting ready to review in this presentation. None of them were written by Benea. Zero. None of these books. OK, so just want to put that out there before we get started. OK, so let's let's get back to it. So first thing we're going to take a look at is the description of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews. The Spanish and Portuguese Jews. All right. So here's the, the first reference. And for most of these references, I, I tried to capture the, you know, the, the title of the book and the author. And sometimes it's on the left hand side. Sometimes it's at the very top. top. But um, it, so if I don't have it on the screen, uh, just go to the website to grab it from there. It should be up there. Um, hopefully by the time this, this video is, is there. OK. All right. So let's get started. So here's the, our first reference. Again, we're, we want to look at the description of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, right? All right, here we go. All right, we're gonna start at the top. We're gonna read quite a bit of this one. So let's start at the top. It says, thus the Jews are a people who have ever according to the prophecy dwelt alone without intermixing with the nations to this day. Now this separate race all descends from brown ancestors. I repeat, now this separate race all descends from brown ancestors for abraham isaac and jacob must have been as dark as mar johanan if not darker exhibit every shade of color from the black jews of malabar of whom we have such an interesting account by dr claudus buchanan to the rose and lily complexion of the jews on the banks of the elip I believe that's in germany and let's keep reading it says we need go no further than the Jews of southern Spain and compare them with those of Holland in northern Germany to perceive a very striking difference. Here we go. It says the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion. OK, I think I need to read that again. It says that the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion. In other words, it's saying 100% of the Spanish Jews are dark complexion. 
And think about it. How different is that than the picture of the Spanish Jews that is out there today? All right. Okay. All right. So that's our first reference. So we get an, an absolute here, which says the Spanish Jews is always dark complexion. So we're getting an idea of the black <laughs> Hebrew Israelites, right? All right. So here we go. Next um, next reference. Your title is at the top. Uh, just go back and say, go, go back and check the website. I'm, I won't read the the, um, the title for each one of these to try to speed it up. So here we go. It says, it's on the right. It says, tis also a vulgar error or a, a, it's a, in other words, it's saying it's a big mistake that the Jews are all black. So he's saying it's a big mistake to think that the Jews are all black. He says, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews. Okay, so let's understand what he just said, right? He says, it's a mistake to say that, that the Jews are all black. He's saying, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews. In other words, he's saying that the Portuguese Jews are what? All black. And then he goes on to explain why. He says, who marrying always among one another beget children like themselves. And consequently, the swarthiness or the blackness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race. So here again, we have a description that tells us that the Jews are all black. And just to, you know, we're going to show it here in, a little bit later in our presentation, but just know that that the references that we're going to read uh, it bounces back and forth between the you know the Spanish Jews and the Portuguese Jews and the thing to keep in mind there is that the Spanish Jews were actually expelled you know they were told to get out and they came out of Spain and then they migrated over to Portugal so that's why you know sometimes when it says Portuguese Jews just know that when it says that it's sometimes referring to the native Portuguese and also the exiles which came from Spain so it's actually talking about both of them but either way, when we look at this, uh, this reference, it's, it's telling us that they're all black, right? They're all black. You know, I won't believe the point there, but, um, you know, just folks who, who get bent out of shape when we say, uh, you know, black Hebrew Israelites, uh, and they respond as if that's a, uh, something of the imagination. You can see here that it's, it's not, right? It's not. I mean, and we, I literally have over 50 of these. Uh, I want to say... I stopped counting after a while, but I believe it's a, over a hundred of these references, uh, in particular that focus on the Portuguese and Spanish Jews. But I will spare you <laughs> the, those references, and I believe in here I only have about ten or, or so. But uh, there are more of those references around, so be be assured of that. All right, okay. So let's go over to our, our next reference, and for this, let's see. Um, start at the top here. It says, though thus separate from the African population, they are black and resemble. The other Negroes, in every respect, as to physical character, it said it is probably an allusion to this case that Pennington, in his textbook, says the descendants of a colony of Jews originally from Judea settled on the coast of Africa are black. All right. And I'm going to skip down to the bottom. There's another little section on the bottom where it says the Portuguese who planted themselves on the coast of Africa a few centuries ago. Have succeed have been succeeded by descendants blacker than many Africans. Okay, okay. So on our next reference, and hopefully you can see this reference. If not, I'm just going to read it to you. Um, um, it says, "As I tentatively survey the Jewish population on the streets of London, it says I fancy I could perceive three different cast of features." And it says, "The first Jewish par excellence." and never to be mistaken. And as we continue to read about the first form, um, I'm going to jump down here to Midway where it says, of the first form, I need say little to you, begging you merely to recollect that the contours convex, the eyes long and fine, and the outer angles running towards the temples, the brow of the nose apt to form a single convex line, and the nose comparatively narrow at the base, the eyes consequently approaching each other, lips very full, mouth projecting, chin small, and the whole physiognomy, or the, the way they look, when swarthy, or when black, as it often is, has an African look. All right, so I, I threw this one in there 
uh, this reference in here because it's a good reference to show that the Jews have an African look. Because sometimes we do get people that say, okay, all right, all right, so you, you, we, we give up. We'll admit the Jews are black, but they don't look African. You know, so I threw this one in there to kind of put that one, that argument to bed. No, they did look African. All right. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, this is just a, a, another one uh, to kind of squash some of these um, these arguments that come up from time to time. And uh, this one comes from, um, I want to say, uh, Hugh Clapperton, who spent time over in, in West Africa or North Africa. And, and when he interacted with the Sheik on the West Coast of Africa, and he recorded the conversation and it went something like this where he asks, or it says, uh, I have read of you, and this is the Sheik speaking back to Clapperton, where he says, I have read of you. You are better than Jews. He said, are Jews white like you? And then Clapperton responds, no, replied I, rather more like yourself. Very dark, right? So, again, I just want to show that using these old references, they understood that these Jews were dark skin. All right. Okay. All right. So let's uh, move on. Let's get back to our Portuguese and Spanish Jews. And here we are. It says, I'm um, going to read just above the, the red line there. It says, well, I guess I can start at the top. It says, in regard to the human race, it has been shown abundantly and historically that each of the external differences often ceases to be characteristics. He says, thus, the black color is found not only in individuals as the black Jews of Portugal. So again, the Jews of Portugal and Spain are black or very dark complexion, right? All right, let's keep it, keep it moving. All right, next one, uh, this is a, a reference from a Jew himself, I believe it's uh, uh, Spinoza. And Spinoza is describing his own race and he says, as he goes on with the description, it says, he was of a middle size, he had good features in his face, the skin somewhat black, and let me, let me slow down here. The skin somewhat black, black curly hair, long eyebrows, and of the same color. So that one might easily know by his looks that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. All right. So again, uh, Baruch Spinoza goes on to show us that people knew that when they looked at a black man, that they knew that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. In other words, they associated the characteristic of the way this person looked to a Portuguese Jew. Okay? All right. So let's keep going. Let's uh, read some additional references. We got, um, let's see how far do we want to go back on this one. Uh, okay, okay, again, we'll start at the top. It says, with reference to the characteristic of color, which are extreme, we have now the opportunities of knowing how much that color is the result of the influence of climate. We know it more particularly uh, by the most invaluable mode of testing, such influences which we derive from the peculiarity of the Jewish race. And it says, for 1800 years, that race has been dispersed in different latitudes and climates, and they have preserved themselves distinct from intermixture with other races of mankind. There are some Jews still lingering in the valleys of the Jordan, have been oppressed by the successive conquerors of Syria for ages. It says, a low race of people, and described by trustworthy travelers as being as black as any of the Ethiopian races. Again, these Jews were described as black. All right, and let's keep moving. I got another reference here. Uh, just trying to drive home the point that these uh, Spanish and Portuguese Jews were black. And let's see here. Um, uh, I guess we can go directly to the underlined line where it says, the Jews of Portugal are very dark. Okay. So hopefully we're establishing a pattern. And here's another one. Uh, I, I like this one. This one's from John Mackey. This one's from the 1700s. Uh, page 26. I think it's like halfway down. It's like the second or third par paragraph. And it says, and he's, he's describing the, um, uh, think uh, like a Duke of Nottingham. And he says, he hath also the exterior air of business and application enough to make himself very capable. In his habit and manners, a very formal, a tall, thin, very black man, like a Spaniard, 
or Jew about 50 years old. All right. So, again, this is talking about a Spaniard. You know, he's, he's, guys like a, he's very black, like a Spaniard or Jew. OK. All right. So hopefully we've read enough references to show you that these Spanish and Portuguese Jews are and are still today black Jews. So if you're doing research on the Jews in Spain and Portugal and you kind of type it into to Google and you get back something that's not always dark or all black, then you know that it is a lie, right? You know that it is a lie because according to the old references, they are always dark complexion, okay? Okay, so now that we've established color of the Jews, so that just so that when we read through these references, I want us to be able to picture in our mind, you know, who we're talking about, okay? Who we're talking about. So let's move on to our, our palpables and edicts. And really, we're going to, for this section, we're going to focus more on the expulsion edicts. And I want to show you that the first, the first thing that happened was that the Jews in Spain were expelled from Spain. And then from Spain, they moved into Portugal. So you can see the map there on your screen. And you can see that the Jews moved from the much larger territory of Spain into the much smaller territory of Portugal. And that resulted in a, a large number of Jews in Portugal, which is significant. Because this is what happened just before the transatlantic slave trade. So just before Spain and Portugal started the transatlantic slave trade, Spain expelled their black Jews. And hopefully, you know, now you can start to see why this information is left out, right? And also, you may want to ask yourself, how come this information isn't known? How come we're not talking about it? But I'm going to show you that this information is actually in several places. It's in several places, right? It's in, so let's take a look. So first thing occurs, Spain kicks out their Jews. And um, let's take a look at a reference here. It's called the History of the Inquisition, right? And um, I'm going to start here, probably the, the third line down off to the to the right, where it says the the number of um, the number of those who were thus banished from Spain, you know, kicked out of Spain, were four hundred thousand Jews, according to Ruchelin and others. All right, so some are estimating the number to be almost half a million. But in this says, Mariana says, Tis not, it's not easy to reduce them to any certain number. He says, most writers affirm that there were 170,000 families. So now we're talking about groups. So one was talking about individuals, you know, uh, a half a million, almost uh, 400,000 individuals. Now we're talking about families, which is a smaller number. So 170,000 families that departed. It says, others say there were 800,000 persons, so 800,000 individuals, almost a million, 200,000 short of a million Jews. I repeat, black Jews were expelled from Spain. And it says a prodigious number, almost exceeding belief. So you got to wonder, you almost have a million black Jews that were expelled from Spain. How come we haven't heard about them and where did they go? So just before the transatlantic slave trade, let me let me get this. Let me paint paint the picture. Just before the transatlantic slave trade, because uh, what I didn't read was was the date at the top. So on the second line, you'll see uh, you know, it says at Granada in 1492, right? So the transatlantic slave trade started in 1501. So we're less than 10 years before the transatlantic slave trade started. Spain kicks out almost a million black Jews. And the reason why they kicked him out, now I guess we'll read it here, but I'll go ahead and spoil it, was because Spain um, gave their Jews an ultimatum. They said, either convert to Roman Christianity or get out. And you can see that almost a million Jews, or 200 short of a million, decided to get out rather, to, rather than to accept uh, the Roman version of Christianity. That is powerful. So, But again, we got to, I mean, we got to wonder, we got to answer the question, where did all these Jews go, all these black Jews who were all black, who were, um, I'm sorry, always of a dark complexion, right? Remember, we, we read that first. It said they're always of a dark complexion. Where did these people that were always of a dark complexion, who are all black, where did they go? 
All right, well, let's keep reading, see if we can find out. So, after the Jews were kicked out of Spain, the next thing that happens was, was that these 800,000 Jews, or um, I'm trying to think of the other, the other number, but a, a large number, were then were then expelled from Portugal. But it wasn't the full number, it was a subset of that number. And we're going to see exactly who was kicked out of Portugal, of those Jews that came into, into Portugal. So let's, get, let's read about some history about what happened uh, when the Jews came over into Portugal. All right. So uh, in this first reference, uh, we're going to read uh, a reference from the official chronicler of King John II. So this is somebody that actually holds a, a position in government. Right, his name is Garcia de Resendi, and it goes on to say, and this is on page 17. It says he reports on one of the methods to populate this island, and he's talking about uh, St. Thomas on the west coast of Africa. And it says, um, it says that also throw some light on the tragic form of Jewish participation in the Portuguese Atlantic Empire. It says the king, and we're talking about King John the Second. So um, King John the Second is, is really central. Uh, to the um, the scattering of the Jews, um, I'll actually put I'll actually include three kings. I'll put three kings in this group. King John the Second is some is a um, a king that you will you will want to remember because he plays a critical role. Uh, Emmanuel, um, which succeeded King John the Second, I believe, I believe it was Emmanuel the First, and then following Emmanuel the First was King John the Third. So you got two King Johns, you know, you got a second and a third, and you got a Emmanuel in in between. So those three kings are critical to the movement of these black uh, these black Jews that were in Spain and Portugal. You know, almost a million that just poof disappeared. I mean, literally, this has to be the the greatest disappearing act of all times. No one knows about them. There's no no books, no no uh, records or traces. So we think of these Jews um, up in Spain and Portugal, but we'll we'll keep reading to see if we can figure out what happened to them. So in this this uh, reference, as we were reading about King John II, it said the king had allowed the Jewish refugees from Spain. So as the Jews were coming in from Spain, from where they had been expelled in 1492. Okay, so we're less than uh, ten years. From the start of the transatlantic slave trade, it says he had allowed them to remain in Portugal only in return for payment of an enormous ransom. And it said in 1493, okay, so a year after uh, they came into uh, Portugal, uh, it says those who could not pay had their children taken away from them, baptized by force and deported to St. Thomas or Sao Tome in order to be raised as Christians and to help populate the island that the king had just leased to Alvaro, who was a, a governor. He was the governor of St. Thomas. So just to recap, the king allowed the Jews to come in. And then a, almost a, six months to a year afterwards, the Jews that couldn't afford to pay, pay the tax, he took away their children. Um, and it was actually the children between the ages of three and ten. And if you can imagine a, a three-year-old, what, I think the three-year-olds are in uh, daycare, right? And a 10-year-old, a 10-year-old is in um, um, elementary school. So you take those kids away from their parents and ship them with strangers by themselves over to the west coast of Africa in great numbers. This, this is one of the, the, dirty, the dirty little secrets of... Um, of uh, of the, I want to say the transatlantic slave trade, but we haven't tied that that together just yet. But this was this was a major, major, major event uh, that occurred in Portugal, and it's recorded like all over the place. Um, but it's never, like I said, it's never talked about when it comes to Black history. And you got to ask why, right? Because here we are, we're dealing with a, a Black people, a people that are always very dark, a people that are all Black, being sent to the west coast of Africa. To the very place that the transatlantic slave trade started, and we are only we are less than ten years before the transatlantic slave trade started, and here we are putting black people, black dark-skinned people, on the west coast of Africa 
in the same places where the transatlantic slave trade is getting ready to start. All right, so let's keep reading because we, you know, we always like to cross-check our references using additional references. So here's our next reference, uh, page 57, and uh, let's see here, and we're talking about King John again, our favorite king. It says, um, and this talks about. Let's see, the, unfortunately, at the time of the expulsion, uh, plague was raging in Castile. So this is talking about in Spain when the Jews were kicked out of Spain. There was a plague at the time, and it says, and the and the fugitives, they're calling them fugitives now, brought with them the disease prop and propagating it with it wherever they went. So we're getting some more information. It's telling us that when the Jews came out of Spain into Portugal, uh, there, uh, there was a disease that followed them into Portugal. And it says, uh, and not unnaturally causing their advent to be viewed with loathing and horror. So in other words, it's saying that when these Jews came in, they brought the disease with them. And of course, you know, you got people coming in, almost a million people. Coming into the country, bringing a disease, you know, uh, the people in Portugal, they it didn't sit well with them, right? Probably just probably wanted them to get out, get out. And it says the circumstance induced King John to hasten their departure from Portugal. Well, there you go. Uh, from which purpose ships were duly provided according to according to the agreement. I'm just looking at my time here. Uh, but such was the temper of the captains, captains and the sailors that they subjected the Jews to the hardest possible condition. They plundered them of their goods and valuables, even to their very clothes, and landed them naked and bare of everything on barren points of the African coast, leaving them to die of starvation or, listen, to be sold into slavery to the Moors. Nor was this all. It says, the king rested or took from their parents all the children between the ages of three and ten of those Jewish immigrants who from poverty or otherwise had omitted to pay the capitation tax on entering. Uh, or, or, and it's actually saying that there were some other reasons why the children were taken from their parents. It says, or uh, who were forced to remain in Portugal. So those that couldn't leave Portugal, uh, that were forced to remain, it says, had them transported to the newly discovered island of St. Thomas. All right, so again, in this reference, we see the same thing that we read in the first reference. The Jews came over, the Spanish Jews, these, these always dark complexion Spanish Jews, uh, almost, a, almost a million, came into Portugal. Uh, the ones that couldn't pay had their children taken away from them. Or, the, or, or and it says, or the ones that, that, that hadn't left yet uh, had their children taken away. And the ones that did leave, they were dumped on the west coast of Africa by the ship captains who were treating them very badly. All right. So, again, we have all of these black Spanish Jews being placed in on the west coast of Africa. Um, omitted, totally omitted from, from history, from so-called African-American history. But we need to pay attention to this, again, because this is in the same exact place of the transatlantic slave trade. And we are only, or we are less than 10 years before the transatlantic slave trade kicks off. All right, so let's keep reading. And let's see here. I'm going to, I'm going to read the whole thing on this one. Uh, why not? It says, The Jews, after the admission into Portugal, were no less unfortunate than the other exiles from Spain. It says, In the year 1493, when King John II conferred this, the, um, what is that word? Siren, I'm not sure what that word is. Of St. Thomas Islands upon oh, Don Alvaro. In other words, he assigned the island to Don Alvaro. He is the governor. He said he obliged the latter to people it. So he wanted the governor, go governor to people this island. And it says, for this purpose, he ordered that all the Jews should have their sons and daughters of tender age taken away from them. And that after the baptism of the latter, these should be have been handed over to Don Alvaro for the purpose of peopling the, the said island of St. Thomas. Okay, so it's say, saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, the, Jew, the children of the Jews, you know, these young, young um, children were taken from their parents and sent over to the west, west coast of Africa. However, one thing we haven't touched on yet is the, um, the number of children that were sent over. Was it just a few? You know, was it just a thousand? I've seen references that talk about, you know, just a, a handful of Jews getting over there. But let's take a look. I'm, like I said, there are plenty of references around 
that describe this major, major, major event that occurred in Portugal, right? By King John the Second. This is King John the Second that we're focusing on so far. All right, so on to our next reference, and this one says, "The sons and daughters shall be given unto another people." It says, "How exactly has this prophecy been fulfilled in several countries, especially in Spain and Portugal?" Oh, it's, this is referring to uh, uh, the biblical pro prophecy. It says, in the former of these kingdoms, the council of Toledo decreed that the children of the Jews should be taken from them and educated in the Christian religion. When they were expelled, all under 14 years of age were forci forcibly detained to baptism. Okay. So again, just another reference uh, talking about the same, same event. Again, a major, major, major event of having these uh, black, these always dark complexion, all black uh, Jews sent to the west coast of Africa. But let's see if we can get some numbers from this thing. Uh, let's see here. It says uh, the first design of settling there was in the year 1486. But perceiving how many had perished in the attempt uh, in that they could better agree uh, with that of the continent on the coast of Guinea. So if you don't know, Guinea's on the west coast of Africa. And I'll pull up a map here shortly. And it says... It was resolved by King John II of Portugal that all the Jews within his dominion, which were, listen, vastly numerous. Wait a minute. So the Jews, these black Jews were vastly numerous in Portugal just before the transatlantic slave trade? Well, let's keep reading. It says, these Jews, which were vastly numerous, should be obliged to receive baptism or, upon refusal, be transported or sent to the west or to the coast of Guinea, which is the west coast of Africa, where the Jews had already several, well, I'm mean, sorry, where the Portuguese had already several considerable settlements and good trade, considering the time since its first discovery. Okay, so again, um, we are um, we are uh, seeing that the Jews were sent over to the west coast of Africa, and we're seeing that the Jews were vast. Excuse me, that the Jews were vastly numerous, right? Vastly numerous. All right, next reference, and it says, all Jewish children below the years, I mean, below fourteen years of age, were torn from their parents' arm, dragged into the church, baptized. Those under three years of age were given to Christians to receive a Christian education. Uh, or, in other words, to be raised as slaves. And we're going to come back to this here. Because the, another point, too, was that the, these Jews were taken from their parents, and the whole purpose was for them to become Christians and to be raised as slaves, right? And again, I, what I tell folks is, you know, these are my words. These is, this is what these authors wrote in their books, Right. So again, so we have all these black, you know, these uh, all always dark complexion, always black Jews um, in um, in, you know, that went from Spain into Portugal. And then here we we have a, an additional reference that says that they were taken from their parents and the purpose of them to be taken to being taken from their parents was twofold. One was that for them to be Christians and two was for them to be raised as slaves. So remember that. We're actually going to see some other references that say the same thing. So now we're, we're starting to tie in these black Jews to slavery, right? We're starting to tie in these black Jews to slavery. And, this, and we're starting to, to um, solve, the, um, um, solve, you know, solve the, the question of, of what happened to all these Jews. Remember, there was almost a million Jews and here today, we're, we're never told that the uh, Spanish and Portuguese Jews were black, one. And two, we're never told that there were so many, there was almost a million of these Jews, two. And then three, we're not told where, what happened to them. They just disappeared, right? But now we're getting, getting some better understanding as to what happened. It says that they were taken, you know, we're looking at the children first, taking a look, a look at the children first, because this was not a, a one-time event, right? And you'll see it here as well. But... Um, you know, first we're dealing with the children. Children were taken from their parents uh, to be raised as Christians and slaves. And it goes on to say that those between the ages of three and ten were put on board of a ship and conveyed to the newly discovered 
unwholesome island of St. Thomas. Right. All right. So same thing. Uh, and skipping down, it says those between 10 and 14 years were sold as slaves. So again, we have black, they have the children of the black Spanish Jews or the Portuguese Jews being sold as slaves. Right around the time of the transatlantic slave trade, right? This is just right around the time of the transatlantic slave trade. And I put this one in just so that you can get an idea of the numbers that, that historians uh, threw out there when it came, came, came to these Spanish Jews. And let's read it. It says, the northern coast of the north northern coast of Africa and the inhabitable regions inland were full of Jews of Spanish de descent. I repeat, it says, were full of Jews of Spanish descent. So within Africa, not only on the coast of Africa, the northern coast of Africa, but in the interior parts of Africa, it says they were full of Jews of Spanish descent. You know, these black, these always dark complexion Jews, right? And it makes sense for them to come to Africa because Africa is a continent of dark complexion people. But let's keep reading. It says they had congregated there in great numbers during the century. So it's going to give us a time frame. It says from the persecution of 1391 to their total expulsion. So which is just before the transatlantic slave trade. So, in other words, we see that there was a, um, a time frame, a window, in which, all, uh, you know, it says great numbers of Spanish Jews started flooding into Africa, okay? Okay, so here's another um, re reference we're going to read. It says, the Castilian Jews, and that's another name for the Spanish Jews, it says, the Castilian Jews who from poverty or from or any other cause had not departed at the time at the at the limited time so in other words if the you know it's just talking again about the spanish jews who had, didn't leave in time um it says the king ordered should be taken for slaves according to the term of their entrance so again we're talking about portugal slaves coming in and they didn't couldn't leave in time um there's some references that sh to show that the portuguese king john uh did some funny business with the with the ships and he and he literally didn't allow them to leave Right, and then they, and then they ended up taking their children. But it says um, his inhumanity. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't finish reading that. It says uh, uh, the king ordered should be taken for slaves according to the terms of their entrance, and uh, distributed th distributed them to whomever asked for them. It says his inhumanity did not cease there. It says he tore he tore their young children from them, and had them baptized. Being at the time desirous of peopling his newly discovered acquisition on the coast of Africa, the island of St. Thomas, he sent them to it. And with the governor, Olivero, we read about Olivero, listen, it says, so that, so that being separated from their parents and marrying people in the island, they might become good Christians. Sorry about that. Screen flipped on me here. So we see that the purpose of them being sent to the island was for them to be separated from their parents. And then the plan was for them to marry people on the islands and to people the islands, right? Because remember, we read the, the his intent was to people the island. He wanted to populate the island. So the, he wanted these, these children to have kids, right? And um, to populate the, populate the island. This is very, 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 very important. Okay, this is very important. So that the um, here we are, and let's get our timeline straight. So in 1493, we'll say 1493, we're sent, we're starting to send these these children to the to the west coast of Africa, and the whole point is you know for them to populate the island, get married, have babies, and to become become Christians. And also keep in mind that, you know, so-called African-Americans today, that the unique um, characteristics of, of so-called African-Americans today is that we don't know our history. And you have to ask yourself, how do you get a people to a point where they don't know their history? Like there are other races 
around the world that have gone into slavery. But when they come out of slavery, they still know their history. And it's because, you know, they've had their elders there all along being able to tell them who they were, you know, you know, their history, their oral history. You know, hey, we're from a people from here and uh, we're really, you know, uh, these people, you know, that sort of thing. But it's when you separate children from the elders who are able to teach history is when you start to develop a people who don't know their history. Right. So that's, that's why I say it's important to to see that the kids were separated from their parents and and they were and when they were separated from their parents, they were actually being separated from their history. And this explains a lot with uh, so-called African-Americans. However, we haven't really tied it back to that so-called African-Americans just yet um, using these references, but we will hear soon. So let's keep reading. Okay, so uh, so far we've read about the expulsion uh, of the of the uh, children under the King John II to the west coast of Africa. Now let's talk a little bit about the the Inquisition. Uh, so here we are. We're talking about uh, Ferdinand. I think uh, it's a king and queen of Ferdinand was a king of uh, Spain at the time. Um, and it says, let's see. It says, and Ferdinand subdued the the Moriscos, and and said subdued the Moriscos. The descendants of the above Moors, it says, many thousand were forced to be baptized or burnt, massacred, or banished, and their children sold as slaves. Besides, innumerable Jews who have shared the same cruelties. All right, so we're talking about the Jews and the Moors. Um, let's see, chiefly by the means, oh, I'm sorry, I stopped too short. It says, Besides innumerable Jews, so when it says innumerable, uh, a lot of Jews, right? Something, if something's innumerable, innumerable, you can't count it because it's so many. And it says innumerable Jews who have shared the same cruelties, chiefly by means of the infernal inquisition. Okay, So that's why I put this, this reference in here just so that you can see the inquisition also um, enslaved the Jews and also actually placed them on the west coast of Africa. And just a quick note about the, about the Moors. Um, there are, are references that also show that the uh, Spain and Portugal ended up showing um, leniency to the Moors or mercy to the Moors because they were afraid of the, um, the of the reprisals or the the um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for of the payback for, you know for any cruelty against the Moors in Spain. They were afraid that their uh, people in other uh, countries that the Moors were were numerous they, that they would be attacked, so they didn't really uh, uh, do the Moors uh, the same way that they did the Jews. The Jews were above and beyond persecuted, well above uh, what was ever done with the Moors. They were actually pretty lenient to the Moors. Okay, so let's keep reading. And on our next reference, it says, uh, "Let's see here." And this is an, another one about the Inquisition. You can see the word Inquisitors. In that top paragraph, we're going to drop down to the, to the second. And this is a person about a Jew that's refusing um, to accept uh, the Roman version of Christianity, and it says, uh, "For refusing to ratify those extorted confessions, after having thrice borne the torture." So it, the Inquisition was all about torturing their victims, either burning them. Uh, there is a long list of tortures that the Inquisition uh, did to their did to. Um, um, the black Portuguese and black Spanish Jews. Uh, I won't go into that detail here in this presentation, but just know that there is a long, gruesome list of tortures that were carried out uh, against these black, uh, always black, um, uh, always dark complexion Jews. And um, yeah, it, it, it was pretty bad. Actually, just a quick note about the Inquisition. Uh, oftentimes when people try to explain or compare the um, uh, the the uh, the transatlantic slave trade. Sorry, I got lost there. But when people try to explain the transatlantic slave trade and compare it to something like, you know, the, the people being stuffed in the ships and living in their feces and being whipped and and starved and all and you know, being boiled in in, in sugar and in, in batch in oil or whatever, having their arms hacked off, um, as some of our brothers have pointed out in their videos. The one, the one event that the transatlantic slave trade is compared to is often the Inquisition. Like when they say that, like the, the 
transatlantic slave trade was so bad, it, it was it was almost like the, the Inquisition. Like only the Inquisition compared to the transatlantic slave trade. And when you think about it, and what we're going to show here is that they both went on at the same time, carried out by the same people, against the same people. So not only did the Jews have to go through the transatlantic slave trade, which we haven't proven 100% yet, but that we will, but they also had to go through the Inquisition. So this was it, it, truly a time for Jacob's trouble. People don't usually tie this back to Jacob's trouble, but I, I think it's, it's partly because people don't know what happened uh, in both the Inquisition and the transatlantic slave trade to be able to see that this was a very bad time for the children of Judah. Okay. All right. So let's get back. Let's get back on topic here. Sorry, guys. Uh, so remember, we, the reason why we're reading this reference is to show that the Inquisition um, also placed the Jews on the west coast of Africa. So we're picking this this uh, this reference up. Uh, this Jew is, is refusing um, to um, uh, accept the Roman version of Christianity. And it says, uh, for refusing to ratify those extorted confession after having thrice borne the torture, which was uh, as often as the rule of the Inquisition allowed, she was condemned, you know, she was condemned to be whipped through the streets by the common hangman and then to be banished for 10 years to the island of Principe, which is on the west coast of Africa, on the west coast of Africa. Well, there you go. So, again, just want to show you that the Inquisition was putting Jews on the west coast of Africa as well. So, on one, on one hand, we have the expulsion edict of King John II and other kings that came after him that put the Jews on the west coast of Africa. And we have the Inquisition that was putting Jews on the west coast of Africa. These always dark complexion, all black Jews on the west coast of Africa. Again, I have to ask a question. Where did they go? <laughs> right. Where did they go? Poof, disappeared, right? All right, let's keep reading. It says, next one says, Barbert states that in the reign of King John II, and about the close of the 15th century, so still talking about the 1400s, it says, listen, large numbers of Jews were expelled from Portugal and taken to the coast of Southern Guinea, which is the west coast of Africa. And it, you know, then it says that the island of St. Thomas, which was more than 100 miles from the mainland, was populated, and it says by mulattoes, uh, from the Jewish exiles and Angola women. And the, you may not know, but the Angola women were also Jews as well. But, okay, so in this, uh, this reference, it shows us that large numbers of Jews were expelled from Portugal and taken to west co the west coast of Africa just before the transatlantic slave trade occurred. Again, what happened to them? The biggest disappearing act of all times. All right, so let's keep reading. And um, we're going to read the, the part that's in the, the section here. Um, and this one actually talks about King John the Third. <laughs> so King John the Third. let's see what happened about, into, about King John the Third. So I'm, I'm actually going to skip down to, I know it's not good to read mid-sentence, but it's pretty, word, it's pretty wordy. Um, so I'm just going to skip down to where it says, that John the Third, King of Portugal, sent a colony thither above two hundred years before, whom though the unwholesome air destroyed, yet the place was not left desolate, for he, King John the Third, sent new inhabitants, who first settled Guinea, west coast of Africa, next Angola. A little bit south, that's, that includes uh, the Congo and uh, Angola, which is a little bit south of the west coast of Africa. Af well, it's the west coast of Africa, but it's south, central and south Africa. And then it says, um, who first settled Guinea, next Angola, and lastly on the island of St. Thomas, we've talked about that, that so they might be better used to the air. And it says that the said king, King John III, sold all those Jews for slaves that are on the west coast of Africa that refused to embrace the Roman religion and caused their children to be baptized from whom these children 
coming thither, west coast of Africa, in great numbers. And it says, most of the present inhabitants were descended. So again, author after author tells us that these Jews were sent to the west coast of Africa. And I do want to take the time to point out that the Jews that were sent to the west coast of Africa were actually the Jews that were, that were resisting the Roman version of Christianity. In other words, you know, when the, the Spanish and the Portuguese gave the Jews an, ult, an ultimatum, they said, hey, you can either stay, you know, become Roman Christians, or you can leave, you know. Um, but if you leave, we're going to take your kids from you, your children from you. I want to point out that the ones that the children that were that were shipped to the west coast of Africa were the were the children of the Jews that were resisting the Roman version of Christianity. OK, so I want to make sure we understand that, that I, I use I call them the rebels. You know, I'm, I'm in some of my videos. I call them the, the rebels. But these were the children of the rebel Jews. These were the children of the Jews that did not want to accept the pope as the replacement of Christ. These were the children of the Jews that did not want to throw away the Sabbath. These were the children of the Jews that did not want to throw away the, the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah. These were the children of the ones that stood up against the Roman version of Christianity. And yet, they were sent to the west coast of Africa for the purpose for them to be made Christians and, remember our references, to become slaves. Right? And to become slaves. So, just want to make sure we understand who, you know, the, the children, the description of the children that were sent to the west coast of Africa. And also, I do also want to show you a map just so that you can get a visual of where these children were sent. So, whenever we say, whenever we read in these references where it says Guinea, that's going to be this, you know, for the most part, these, this yellow territory here on the map. And then uh, Angola is a little bit below the yellow territory, ter well, not a little bit, it's a lot of uh, is a, the territory below the yellow um, uh, territory on the map. And there's also a small territory up here. I want to say it's in Senegal uh, up here as well that's not uh, shown. But for the most part, it's the west coast of Africa, right? And this is where, this is ground zero for the transatlantic slave trade. So just before the transatlantic slave trade, we just, we just have a, a, a large number of black, of all black Jews sent to the west coast of Africa. And poof, where did they go? The question is, where did they go? All right, so I got a couple of things on the, on the screen for you. One is, is just a quick um, um, snapshot of a map. Actually, it's just a, a crop. I cropped a picture of a, of a map. And what's circled there is the French word for the kingdom. It says the kingdom of Judah. So this is the slave coast. And it's the, it's the slave coast when the Portuguese took the children and placed them on the west coast of Africa, the Portuguese then named pieces of the west coast of Africa, or part of the west coast of Africa, and they called it the Kingdom of Judah. So, the, let me say it again. The Portuguese took these children, these Jews, these children of Judah, from, the, from uh, Portugal, put them on the west coast of Africa, then they named um, part of the west coast of Africa the Kingdom of Judah. And let's read about it. Um, you can see it on your screen there. Let me see if I can zoom in. Well, I'll just read it for you. And it says, uh, East of the Popo begins the Dahomey territory guarded by the important town of Gliwitz. Uh, it says, known to Europeans by various names. And I'm going to skip here. It says, the old writers called it Judah. And its inhabitants were said to be Jews. While the neighboring river Alala, whose real name is Ephra, became the Euphrates. Now, I do want to point out here is that when the Jews were, were placed in different places, they, they, they have a, we have a habit of the Jews naming things, um, uh, naming things after the places where they come from. So we know that the Euphrates River is uh, close to Jerusalem. So when these Jews were placed on the west coast of Africa, they didn't, start, they didn't name, name the river the Euphrates. And you can actually see it. I don't know if you can see it there, but there's a, a yellow circle. But at the top of that yellow circle is a, a river. And it's called the Euphrates. So they literally named a river in the kingdom of Judah, which is the slave coast, the Euphrates. All right, so here we go. 
so what happened uh, to these Jews? Uh, it, says, it says the old writers call it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be Jews. Okay. And it says the neighboring river, the Lala, became the Euphrates. It says, listen, it says, during the flourishing days of the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, it says from 16 to 18,000 were annually transported from a Judah, uh, from Judah, as the Portuguese called this place, right? And also, no, I want, want to point out that a Judah, um, there's two, I've seen people, People try to debunk the word Judah here. It's that it is in fact Judah, right? Because we see that it's the Jews there, and they called it Judah. And actually, Ah Judah, if you look it up in um, Google translation, does mean Judah. It also means help, but it does mean Judah. And in this reference, it's, it's calling it Judah. But let's keep reading. It says during the first days of the slave trade, from sixteen to eighteen thousand were annually transported from Ah Judah. As the Portuguese called this place, which at the time had a population of thirty-five thousand, so that place had a had a population of thirty-five thousand Jews at the time, and each year they were they were, and of course they were they were having kids and stuff like that. But you can see each year they were taking taking out eighteen thousand, sixteen thousand, right? A lot of Jews were taken from those those um, from the kingdom of Judah and shipped via the transatlantic slave trade. And then I believe this is the last uh, reference, which speaks about the uh, the Jews being on the west coast of Africa. Uh, you know, we, um, and this is uh, one that was in French, and I had to translate this one. And um, actually, I, I you know I give credit where credit is due. I think one one of the brothers. Uh, had translated translated this one and um, came behind him and, and did the same thing as well. Um, but he, you know, they, he was the first to share this out. But uh, it says the same thing. It says, you know, Wida uh, Ajuda is an ancient city frequented since the 16th century by the Portuguese slavers who gave it its name. So just want to point out that it was the Portuguese who gave. This place is to gave the kingdom of Judah its name. After all, they were the ones that placed the children on the west coast of Africa in the first place. Right. And it says its inhabitants were called Judaic. Right. And indeed, they were regarded as a remnant of the scattered tribes of Israel. OK. All right. So let's do a recap. Let's recap what we've learned so far, what we've read so far. Uh, we've learned that the um, Portuguese placed the Jews on the west coast of Africa, and I I, I lump three kings into that, and, and of course it may be more, but it's just that the what what we've studied so far is King John II is the one that kicked it off, taking the children from their parents, putting them you know in great numbers on the west coast of Africa. Uh, we also read a reference from King John the Third. Uh, who also placed the Jews on the west coast of Africa in great numbers. So it looks like there were um, there were multiple waves of children being placed on the west coast of Africa. And then we follow that up with references to show that these children were indeed um, made to be slaves and then shipped out, um, of course, through the uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, one of the places that the children were placed was called the Kingdom of Judah. It was named that by the Portuguese who were sending them there. And then it also told us that they were uh, sent out as slaves. Okay. All right. So um, so now that we've, we've read about the expulsion edicts, and we also read just a little bit about how the Inquisition also put the Jews on the west coast of Africa, and we read about the Jews um, being made slaves, let's take a look at a few things. Let's, I want to ask you a question. What did they call these Jews? Let's think about that for a moment. So these Jews were taken from Portugal, you know, placed in, in Spain. My question is, what were these Jews called? All right, so if you're stumped, um, like you know, most folks are, let's uh, take a look. Let's start off by, remember we were uh, looking at that word Negro at the very um, top, at the beginning of, the, of our uh, presentation. So let's take a look at the word Negro. And we're going to look at the definition of the word Negro in the Oxford Dictionary. And it says, you know, Negro, it means a member of a dark-skinned group of people 
originally native to Africa, south of the Sahara. Okay, so in other words, Negro means a, a person, an African person, a dark-skinned African person, right? A native, I'm sorry, a native dark-skinned African person. But then if we keep, uh, scroll all the way down to the bottom, it says usage. It says the word Negro was adopted from Spain and Portugal. And then it says, and first recorded from the mid-16th century, so during the 1500s. So um, in the 1500s was when the word Negro meant a native African dark-skinned person. Okay? But let's, uh, like we you know, always like to cross-check our references, so let's cross-check that with Webster's. So Webster's Dictionary says pretty much the same thing. It says, Negro, a member of a race of human, uh, humankind native to Africa and classified according to physical, physical features such as dark uh, skin pigmentation. Okay? It's pretty much in the same, um, with, in alignment with the, um, with the Oxford Dictionary. And we're going to take a look at the usage that um, the first time it was used according to the Webster Dictionary. It says, wow, look. It's giving us an exact date, 1555. So according to Webster, in 1555, the word Negro was first used to mean a native <laughs> African. Uh, it was in 1555. So I'll tell you what. Let's take a look at the reference that Webster was referring to. So we're going to go to... Uh, 1555. So this, what you're looking at is a, uh, a book that was written in 1555. You can see that I have it underlined, right? It says publication date, 1555. And what I underlined for you is the first time that the word Negro was used to refer to someone that was a native African, right? So the first time that the word Negro um, meant a native African was in 1555. And look, it's referring to someone that was in Guinea. It says Negro de Guinea. Okay, you got it? So the first time it was referring to a native African uh, was in 1555, and it referred to a Negro of Guinea. All right. So uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going because we want to dig in a little bit further. So we went to the etymology, etymology online to look up this word Negro. So again, we're seeing the same thing. Negro, 1550s, means a member of a black skin race of Africa, right? 1550s. But before the word Negro meant a member of a black skin person of Africa, let's go up one box. The box above it says Negro, Portuguese, black. Hmm. Negro, Portuguese, black. So before 1550, the word Negro meant Negro. It was a Portuguese black. So in other words, it was a Portuguese word for black, right? So let's look at that on our timeline. Here we are. And we look at the word Negro. It's at the, at the bottom. You can see in roughly 1550, 1555, the word Negro meant an African people. But before then, I have question marks. You know, before 1555, what did the word Negro mean? All right? And just to take a look at the timeline before 15, 1550, we have a couple of things happen, right? We have the Jews being expelled. We haven't really talked about the palpables. Um, but the Jews were at least expelled from Spain right before the transatlantic slave trade. And they were placed on the west coast of Africa. And the, the whole point of them being placed on the west coast of Africa, Africa was for them to uh, become Christians and slaves. And they were to, to be, and to people the island, right? Because they um, ended up uh, having those kids marry um, the, those Angola women who were, who were also uh, from the tribe of Judah. So, after the kids were placed on the west coast of Africa uh, and they married uh, the, the Angolas, after a little short time after that, was when, and they were placed, remember, remember in our, our reference, uh, they were placed on Guinea, you know. So here we are in Guinea. They were being placed on Guinea, and then a few a few years later, then we have a definition of the word Negro to mean uh, a native African in Guinea. 
All right. So hopefully you're seeing things are starting to kind of line up here, but we need more, right? We need need some more proof. So first things first. Let's. You may not know that the Jews were called by another name. The Jews were called by another name, and let's read it. It says in Portugal, the name. Oh, I'm sorry. In Portugal. So again, we're talking about Portugal, who were the ones that took they took the Jews out and put them on the west coast of Africa, right? You'll learn that Portugal hate Portugal hated the Jews with the with the passion, uh, and you can probably see that, right? So in Portugal, it says. The name of a Jew is a term of such high reproach that the government found it necessary necessary to enact a law which forbid any person to call another by that appellation or by that name. It said, if a man who is styled a Jew to uh, who, yeah, it said if if a man who is styled a Jew to his face stabs the offender. The law does not condemn him. So, in other words, if a person is called a Jew to his face and the other person were to kill him, it said the law did not condemn the person for killing that other person, right? Because, you know, they couldn't call a Jew a Jew. Or they couldn't call another, they couldn't call a person a Jew. They couldn't, they could not use that name according to this reference. So then the question comes, what, if they can't, if they couldn't call a Jew a Jew, what did they call him? Sure, you're probably already guessing, but let's 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 take a look. So we read this. I, I pulled out this reference before, but let's take a look. So we're going to go back to the time of King John the Second again. This is during the time of the expulsion, and it says King John the Second in 1492 expelled all the Jews uh, to the island of Saint Thomas, which had been discovered in 1471, and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. Okay, so I do want to point out that King John II not only sent them to uh, the island of St. Thomas, but also to other places on the west coast of Africa. And that's also what this this um, this uh, reference is pointing out. So, yeah, they went to St. Thomas, but they also went to other places on the west coast of Africa. And it says, and to other Portuguese settlements on the west coast, I'm sorry, and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And listen, listen close, closely, it says, and from these banished Jews, the black Portuguese, as they are called. First thing we need to we need to point out here is that it is the banished Jews that are called black Portuguese during the time of King John II. Second. second thing I want to point out is that the Portuguese, right? Remember, this was a, uh, we read in the, the previous slide that it was a Portuguese law that said that they can't call a Jew a Jew. So what did the Portuguese call the Jews? Well, they were calling them black Portuguese. What is the Portuguese word for black? Negro. You see where we have Negro here? So we had the word Negro, which meant a, um, a black skin race of Africa in 1550s. But before then, it referred to black Portuguese, Negro. Got it? So the word Negro was used to describe the black Portuguese Jews. And Let's see here. I believe, um, yeah, I was using this reference just to show you that the Jews were placed on the coast of southern Guinea. Um, so you see large number of Jews were expelled uh, from, the port, from Portugal and taken to the coast of southern Guinea. And these Portuguese Jews were called black Portuguese, or they were called Negro Portuguese, or they were called Negroes. And then once they were sent to the uh, southern Guinea or the west coast of Africa, they said, well, here it says southern Guinea, right? The very first reference that um, the, uh, the Webster Dictionary says was used to describe a, a, a uh, how can I put it? The very first reference which meant a African, a native African people, referred to Negroes of Guinea. All right, Negroes of Guinea. 
So the whole point of, of these references is to show that the Portuguese were called Negroes. The Portuguese were called Negroes. I'm just going to backtrack here just so that you can see where it says these banished Jews, the black Portuguese, as they are called. The word black in Portuguese is Negro. So the, these Jews were called Negroes. Okay? And just as, an, as a, uh, another, I want to throw another reference in here. And that's one, one of the ones I put in other videos where it says, the Jews are composed of three or four separate racial elements. The, the Asiatic Negroid strain shows itself occasionally in curly hair and the long eye and por proportions of the skull. The Jewish hybrids with the Negro in Jamaica and Ghana reproduce most strikingly the Assyrian type. So now this, this reference you know, makes a little bit more sense knowing that the Portuguese uh, called their Jews, their, ex their expelled Jews, Negroes. Okay? All right.